Okay, let's go ahead and get started with the uh, second part of the morning session, improving the reliability of published results. And our sp first speaker is Dr. Galen Edwards from the University of Georgia. Please come forward. Um, well, like others, I'm very grateful to be here and like, would like to thank the organizers for, for putting this together. Um, I wear a number of different hats and today I'm actually representing the American Physiological Society and I'm um, not one of the editors. I have served on many, a number of editorial boards, so I'm familiar with the publishing process. Um, we've consulted the editorial editors of our journals for a number of the items I'm going to speak to today. And I'd also like to point to the great assistance from Christina Bennett, who I will lean on heavily in the question and answer period um, for specifics of the APS journals. And um, also Alice Ranon, who's not in her seat yet, but I'm sure she'll be back momentarily. Um, the American Physiological Society, or APS, publishes 14 different journals, all of which cover some aspect of animal research. Um, you know, we have you know, the American Journal of Physiology. There are seven editions. Many of you are probably familiar with these. Um, they range from endocrinology to cell, um, cardiovascular, comparative. Um, there's also physiology, physiological reviews, physiological genomics, the Journal of Neurophysiology, the Journal of Applied Physiology, Advances in Physiology Education, and then a, a newer journal, which is an online journal only, which is the Physiological Reports. Um, so again, a total of 14 different journals that do publish um, all aspects of animal research. Um, we have specific instructions to authors. Um, those of you who publish in these journals are probably somewhat, at least somewhat familiar, if not very familiar with these instructions. I'll um, highlight a few of the details of, of those instructions in a, in a minute or two. And we also have instructions for reviewers and those of us who review for the journal um, I, will, I can't say that I read them every time I do read a paper or review a pa manuscript for the APS journals, but I, I do review through or glance through them quite often. If we look at the instructions that the journals offer that are related or relative to the reproducibility in animal research, there are a couple highlights in the instructions I'd like to point out. Um, we do have specific instruction to verify that the study can be replicated, and here's that verbiage. The description of animal procedures in the manuscript should be sufficient to permit readers to evaluate the quality of the data presented and to replicate the experiments if necessary. So it's specifically stated there. Again, do people actually read that? I honestly don't know, but we do have instruction to that. Uh, we also have a specific instruction that includes doses of anesthetics and analgesics. And um, I think that infers also the routes by which they are administered. We don't have specific instruction to test items, you know, as to how that should actually be presented in the journals. Um, that's something that might be considered, but uh, might be a question that you might um, pose. We are somewhat unique in that we, the reviewer of our journal articles can call for review of animal use. Now, generally, this is a call for review based on an ethical concern. So something they're doing to the animals that the reviewer thinks might be unethical. Um, and Christina actually plays a really prominent role in this review. She gets numerous requests from reviewers regarding animal use and the appropriateness of animal use. Most of that is resolved. Um, simply with some back and forth with the authors to resolve the, the specific question that was, was asked by the reviewer. Occasionally, though that goes on up, I'm actually the person who reviews that. I'm the chair of the ACE Committee for the American Physiological Society. So if there's a real concern about um, ethical use of animals, that actually comes on up to me as well as other editors in the, in the APS journal family. So there is a really a, a group decision made as to the ethical appropriateness for many of, a, of those types of questions. We do ask questions about animal numbers. 
Um, it's kind of buried a little bit, and maybe this is just something that sh um, could be a more specifically outlined or described in the instructions. <clears throat> Basically, investigators should consider the appropriateness of the experimental procedures. This gets to the question that came up yesterday about cost-benefit analysis. So is the animal model you're using and the experiments you con are conducting appropriate, and do they actually benefit the knowledge base that we are trying to expand? The species of animals used and the numbers of animals required. Um, it's not specifically laid out as to how that is achieved. It, it just points out that that needs to be considered. And we'll talk more about that when I um, get into some of the, the questions we pose to, to our editors of, of the various journals. Now, <clears throat> as I said, I'm, I'm not an editor on the, of any of these journals, but we did pose a number of questions to the editors of these journals, and I'd, I'd like to go through some of what they responded back to us. Uh, oh, I should also point out that authors are apprised of the Arise <laughs> Arrive guidelines and the three R's um, as they are submitting their, their articles for <coughs> review. So there are a number of specific instructions as to you know, re reproducibility, um, doses of drugs that are used. Um, we can review animal use. It's often called for by a reviewer. We do have some instruction about animal numbers, and <clears throat> the authors are apprised of the ARRIVE guidelines in three R's. Now, I should also point out before I jump to the, the editor's comments that if you recall that list of journals, there's a wide range of types of studies that the American Physiological Society journals cover. So, you know, there's not a one-size-fits-all. I think that came up earlier today. One size doesn't fit all. With our family of journals, one set of instructions is not going to be applicable to every <coughs> journal we have. So we, we do need some flexibility in the, the way we deal with data coming in for the various types of, or the various journals we, we publish. In our review with the editors, I mentioned we asked them a number of questions. <coughs> Um, interested in, in what they felt about things like, can we provide more detailed methods? We've heard about limitations on, you know, space in journal articles for providing detailed methods. In the APS journal family, we can provide that. There is no limit on the amount of space you can de devote to your method section. So there's really no reason, at least by our standards, to, to cut out some of your methods section. And all of the editors agreed with this. We asked them about a checklist for the author, you know, to verify that they had everything that was there. Um, some of them were, they had some favorable comments and obviously some that were not so favorable. Uh, some of the editors thought they could be useful. But we need to be flexible. Again, the journals in our family cover a wide range of topics, um, from cell biology to neurophysiology to comparative physiology. So having a checklist that covered everything, that would be a humongous checklist, one. And one of the points, there it should come up here, that a number of people who favored checklists made was that the checklist should be limited to a single page. That is, it, it shouldn't be so onerous that people just throw it in their recycling bin and move on to the next page. Uh, so it, it could be a useful um, exercise. Um, there were some cons to, to the checklist for the author. Uh, people felt it would be a burden to the author. This is a concern for uh, us in that you know, we, we don't want to drive authors away. We're, we're not nature and science. And some of our journals are not in the, the really high impact factor family. So we don't want to burden the authors with extra work or checking off checklists just to, to have busy work to, to fulfill a checklist. And <clears throat> there was also a consideration that there's no need to reiterate previously published methods. I personally have a, a bit of a problem with this. I've reviewed, and I'm sure many of you have, papers where, you know, they reference the methods of Dr. John Smith. Well, you go to the 
you know, their bibliography and you pull out Dr. John Smith's paper and you go to his paper and that says references the methods of Dr. Dan Jones. Okay, so I go to his paper and I pull out his methods and I, wait, this references the, you know, of Dr. Stanley Johnson. Pretty soon I'm back to 1980. Um, the anesthetics are different, <clears throat> the husbandry is different, the animals are different, the whole bloody thing is different, and yet we're not printing what we're doing today. Um, so I'm, I guess I, I have a, an issue with this comment about just let's cite previously published methods and, and say that everything's staying the same. Um, research evolves and, and you know, we're all very thankful for that. We heard some great science this morning that you know, 20 years ago, I would have never dreamed I would have seen at a, a scientific conference. So, um, our methods evolve as well, and, and, you know, citing a method again and again and again, I don't think is always appropriate. They also, <coughs> a couple people commented that this review of methods is already covered by the IACUC. Um, that is absolutely not true. Um, the IACUC looks at general animal use. They don't go into detailed methods. Uh, or if they are, I, um, Jerry will probably talk more about that this afternoon. Um, if IACUCs are going into detailed <coughs> methods, they're um, probably overstepping what they really need to do. Um, we as scientists need to evaluate the science. And if we want to evaluate the science, and that's really not a charge to the IACUC, is to evaluate the science, we really need detailed methods. So again, this is a, one of the cons uh, <clears throat> for the, the author checklist that I, I really do question a bit. We asked them about a methods checklist for the reviewer. Uh, and again, there was kind of a mixed response. Many of them actually felt this could be a useful method to verify important details are covered. And as I was putting this talk together, excuse me, kind of dawned on me that as I review papers, there are many times that, you know, you're, we're all pressed for time and you're shooting through your review and you, you know, you write it up and you shoot it in and then you, you go back and, you know, the editor sends you back all, everybody's comments and you look at the second reviewer's comments and you go, oh my gosh, how did I miss that? Um, there are oftentimes I think a checklist would be useful for me. I don't know about all of you, but um, it could certainly be, help occasionally for me to make sure that all the important details are covered. Again, we need to be flexible. Um, we have a, in our large family of journals, we have a, a wide variety of types of data and concerns that um, are covered. So we, we can't have a short checklist that fits every journal we, we publish. A few of the cons, um, again, this goes back to increased burden. If we're giving people's, people checklists, we're asking them to again, maybe do more menial tasks. Um, I'm not exactly sure this is true. I, sometimes I find that if I have a checklist, I can actually proceed more efficiently through a project than if I'm just kind of trying to wing it and figure out how to, to work through the, the problem independently. And again, one size doesn't fit all. So uh, and really this goes to the fact that we're a, a large group and we ha publish a, a fairly significant number of physiological and animal um, type studies. Publishing negative data was supported by every editor. Everybody said, yes, we should publish negative data. There were some caveats. There was a concern that we need to avoid false negatives. Uh, this we may, I can bring up a little later as I talk about um, numbers of animals, which was a concern across everybody that we've talked to. And uh, as we've heard here, numbers in experiments is a, a big concern. Everybody felt it's okay if the methods are sound and properly reported. And it was even brought up, and I've, I've heard it here, that we, maybe we could pre-approve experiments. That is, you submit a set of experiments to a journal. They're pre-approved, they're executed according to the, the plan you've laid out, and you publish their results regardless of outcome, be they positive or negative, as long as you follow the methods that you wrote out. Uh, this will really take a change in culture. Uh, I don't know that that's going to happen 
overnight, but obviously our editors are, are considering this. They also said it could be published in an alternative journal. Our physiological reports, our online journal, is new, uh, and we often refer articles that are rejected in one of our higher tier journals to physiological reports. In fact, if, I think if you review journals for the APS family, you may get a message in your request as a reviewer if you would be, you know, if you would consider having your review carried forward to physiological reports. So this may be a, an alternate route for those types of, of negative data. There was a concern that since negative data are often poorly cited, or they may not be cited very often, um, that they will have an effect on our impact factor. We are a journal. You know, we publish, we're interested in, in having a significant impact factor. The current culture you know, relies greatly on impact factor. I'm a department head. When I'm putting faculty up for promotion and tenure, we look at impact factors of journals they're publishing in. I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, my, my work environment is a veterinary school. Veterinary journals do not have high impact factors. We're a small cadre of people. We can't have high impact factors, and yet we still are hung up on this idea that you've got to look at impact factor. Well, no, you need to look at where the, the material is being published. If you're publishing in the appropriate place, it should be um, considered appropriate. But this is still an issue for us to consider. There's also <coughs> probably a, a very true concern that reviewers, editors, and authors, um, that wasn't listed by the editors, I would add that here, are biased against publishing negative data. You know, I was, as I was putting this together, I was thinking back, I don't think I've ever submitted a, an article that had only negative data in it. I've had negative data with, embedded within a publication, but never submitted a publication with only negative data. Um, so I, th I think this is very true, that we do have a bias against negative data. Uh, and that's, again, something that maybe we need to you know, tackle as a culture. Uh, but it, it's out there. There were some other comments that we elicited from the group. Um, there was this, uh, actually several people pointed to the emphasis on replicating findings in multiple strains and species. We just heard in the last group of, of talks that you know, replicating or reproducing a finding across species or even across strains um, actually contributes to the robustness of that finding. And this is, a, this is something we should really um, probably strive for. And not really probably, that's kind of contradictory. We should strive for this. <laughs> Somebody suggested random data audits. Um, Alice, I suggested that she volunteer for that service. She immediately, um, I, won't, I won't say what she said, but, um, <laughs> but obviously there's a tremendous burden placed on you know, a publisher to, to go out and do random data audits for all of the journal articles you have. We have 14 different journals. Think of all the data sets that we would have to look at. This, um, I'm, I won't reveal the name of the person that suggested this, but I really don't think this is a, something that we can do at the time. A suggestion that we require at least 90 percent power. Um, this is fine if it's a study that you can actually do a power analysis. Many of us know that if we're looking at hypothesis generating studies, we don't know what the variance is. Um, and many of those studies are the very studies that produce these kind of blockbuster findings that you know, kind of change the direction of our research. We can't do a power analysis on those. Um, so doing that is a little, you know, it's gonna push back against some of those kind of really cutting edge studies that we really like to see in our journals. Now for testing that hypothesis, once you've made that discovery, yeah, maybe this is a, something, a goal we should strive for. But as we've heard here yesterday, um, over and over again that if you actually go in and look at the power, if you take the data sets and actually do the, the actual power analysis on their data set, 
Um, I don't know of many papers that would ever come close to this um, bar. I, 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 it, to me, it's actually a dream. I, I just don't think we're doing it. There was also a suggestion about inclusion of supplemental data. Now, in our family of journals, the reviewers don't review the supplemental data. We know that by asking them. And really, there's no limit on how much you could put in the manuscript. You can put all of your data in the manuscript. We don't have page limits. Again, going back to our suggestions on the, on the instructions to authors. Some other considerations we discussed with the editors and with the APS Council. Um, one thing that came up again and again, and certainly at APS Council, <coughs> was the variation within the source of animal. And this is something that we've known about for many years. I was thinking back to um, when I was a postdoc. We knew to order our rats from a certain vendor because you got the best behavior from those rats. We were studying sodium appetite at the time. Um, is this an issue with the vendors? Um, and is this something we should talk about with the vendors? Personally, I think yes. I, you know, I tell people in psychology who, at my institution, who are you know, very finicky about how their animals were handled and you know, once they're in their cages and stuff, I said, if you knew what was going on at the vendors, you'd probably fall over dead. Um, <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff going on at vendors. You know, we know within the same company that people get an animal from you know, one state and an animal from another state, and phenotypically they're different. Many investigators know that, and that was brought out at, at our council discussions. And so, you know, the idea of, of talking to the vendors, where, are we, where am I going? Oh, there we are. Um, is this a husbandry issue? Could be. Um, I think there's a lot of people would argue it is. Um, and it goes back to what was brought up um, earlier this morning as well as yesterday. We need to consider how the animals are treated, not just in our experimental paradigm, but by the the handlers on a day-to-day -day basis. And that goes from the time they're born at the vendor to the time you, you know, your experiment is terminated. There was a concern raised by, <coughs> excuse me, some of the editors for proper controls of genetically mutated mice. This really goes back to a breeding issue. If you're breeding heterozygotes and you want to compare your homozygotes to the wild type, that means that you've got 50% of your population that are still heterozygotes in your, in your litters that you really don't have too much to do with. Um, this is an area that uh, this editor um, argued that people often cut corners and that they uh, may not be using proper controls and that they're not using the homozygous wild types. We heard just in the question and answer from the last session about the variability in microbial communities in animal models and how that impacts phenotype. Uh, our GI editor, um, this is a big concern for her. And this is going to be impacted not only by the type of food they get, which we've heard and I was going to mention it varies from season to season, but also by the animal handlers who have a different microbiome across, you know, even different vivaria at your institution. So this is probably going to rise in <coughs> consideration as we move forward. There was a, a suggestion to publish confirmatory findings. Uh, I find this a, a really interesting idea for, for these high-risk studies. Um, should we be you know, seeking people to confirm the, the studies? Uh, is there a clearinghouse for methodological protocols? I'm going to get cut off here real quick. <laughs> um, who maintains this? And then this goes back, high impact articles should have an open period to, in journals to allow replication or refutation. Um, again, the confirmatory findings. Then the last slide, the biggest thing that everybody con was concerned about were animal numbers and experiments. We all talk about the three R's. Um, there's also a cost consideration. And we often view this as an ethical issue. Um, though I would argue that maybe instead of three R's, which we often use to minimize the number of animals that we're trying to use, that we maybe think of three O's, where we optimize animal numbers so that outcomes are reliable and, the o and these overcome issues of reproducibility. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you.
And next we have Dr. Damien Pattinson, the Executive Director of PLOS, PLOS One. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm uh, Damien Pattinson, um, Editorial Director of um, PLOS One. I thought, so Elizabeth covered some of the, the things that we've been doing um, in her talk yesterday. So what I thought I'd do is try and broaden it out a little bit and talk about uh, some sort of interesting things that, that, well, we're doing and that other journals are doing as well. So it's a slightly broader overview um, in terms of the, uh, you know, how the kind of journal community and PLOS are, um, are tackling some of these issues in reproducibility. Um, so there, there are two aspects to it, really. The, the first one is, is about how we can improve the standards of reporting and how we can um, make sure that the published literature is as accurate as possible. But then there's also the second side, which I think is less talked about, but probably, from my point of view, more interesting, which is the, the idea of how you um, alert readers to, um, um, to perhaps um, new data that, that would that, um, suggest that... Um, uh, that perhaps that you know um, previous studies are less reliable, um, and that's something that I think is particularly problematic, um, and and it seems incredibly fixable in this um, internet era. So uh, so that's something that I'll talk a bit about um, as well. But first of all, just to talk about standards, I know we've talked a lot about this already, so I won't go into it in a great amount of detail. But um, this is a <laughs> slide that seems to um, cover a lot of the problems uh, that we see with uh, with standards. Uh, this is from X, X, um, XKCD. Uh, it's, and, and this is a real issue, um, I think, for all of us. And I think, you know, um, Jilly alluded to it yesterday. That there is a need to, uh, to have some, uh, some way of kind of, of working together. And so that was part of the reason that we had this meeting on Monday. And again, Elizabeth mentioned this, that we, had, uh, that we were summoned by the editors of Nature and Science uh, to a meeting with, some, uh, with journal heads and um, funders to talk about how journals can do a better job of, um, of, um, of making the data more reproducible and, uh, and coming up with standards. So in a way, we, we fell guilty to this exact thing and we came up with our own list and, uh, and that's something that will, I think, um, come out fairly soon. But there were lots of, there was lots of great buy-in. There were lots, all the journals... Uh, seems to be very on side and aware of the, the seriousness of this issue, and um, it was so it was an encouraging meeting. I thought um, they uh, so things like you know expanded method sections and, and those kinds of um, aspects are all things that that pretty much everyone bought into and was was willing to um, to try and change. Um, the moment at the moment the standards are very different um, in journals. There are. Um, I think uh, we are doing some work on arrive guidelines. I mentioned yesterday that in cases um, of uh, where we, we have some concern over the, um, the, the reporting of the animal work, uh, we do ask for the arrive, gui arrive guidelines um, with pretty good uptake. And, uh, and yeah, authors are generally willing to go along with that. Uh, Nature have got their own checklist um, that they, I think they use on all their journals now. Science have just introduced one. First of all, they introduced it in um, trans translational medicine. It's now gone into science itself, um, whereby at revision, they will ask for this um, quite detailed checklist that goes the kinds of issues with reporting that we've talked a lot about. So there are these competing standards. Um, it would be nice to try and unify them where possible. Um, and just, yes, as I said, on PLOS um, Arrive is a big part of us. We ask for consort for clinical studies. We um, um, recommend a great deal more from a place like the Equator Network. Uh, we also have a whole um, animal um, ethics to an extremely high standard. Um, and in fact, higher than I think we can trust our academic editor community to oversee consistently. People do, edit, um, editors do have varying degrees of interest um, in this area. Some people s seeing it as much more important than others. So actually we um, have taken, taken the burden um, sort of in-house and that we have quite a big team of internal editors on PLOS One now um, who, who do check the um, eth ethical oversight of all the papers um, in order to keep a kind of consistent and very high standard. So, um, I won't say any more about that. The next thing I want to talk about with, briefly was uh, data, um, which is clearly a very big part. I think Glenn Begley demonstrated brilliantly yesterday um, the importance of, of, of showing the data, that it's not enough to have these, um, these very kind of high-level um, summary figures and that you do need to actually see what's going on behind. This is a paper from Science um, a, few, was it? a few months ago, I think, um, which basically shows that you know, the community really do see a need for this. A lot of people ask for data. Very few of them can get it. Um, they almost never get it from uh, the literature, even though they, they, they try. So, uh, so there is clearly a gap here. And in fact, if you 
ask them where, where the data is stored, you can see, you know, 50% say in the lab, 40% the university server, which is basically the same thing. Only 7% of data available in repositories. So it's, you know, this is really um, a, big, a big issue. And um, so despite the fact, uh, the strong feeling for a need of it, I think that's not in any way supported by the, the actual reality. This is a fairly terrifying graph um, from a, uh, uh, the uh, executive editor of um, evolutionary, um, what's it called, molecular evolution, Tim Vines. And he's done some research on, on how easy it is to get hold of data. And if you can see here, oh, sorry, basically after, um, you know, 10 to 15 years, the data, you know, this is 10%, basically. So the data is just not available. So by, you know, 10, 10 to 15 years out, you basically can't get hold of, of original data sets anymore. So, and that will always be the case. You know, you can't really expect people to, to archive their data in any kind of meaningful way um, unless they are doing so in a public place. And so the thing we've really pushed very hard for is, um, is deposition in repositories. And I'll just briefly mention that. So what we did, this is, to us is a big issue. I think data has any number of um, other reasons why it's important to share data, but I think reproducibility is a really important one. Um, and so we um, came up with a forum uh, to discuss this uh, in, in February with uh, lots of um, librarians and institutions, and lots of academics. We, um, we got them to, to talk about what they thought was most, um, most important on this, and we came up with a, a set of principles. This is actually, I'll just quickly go through these, but this is basically um, ordered by priority. So the most important thing everyone felt was that they established and enforced mandatory data availability policy. And mandatory is the key word here. If you look at almost all journals, they, they say you need to make the data available, but very few do anything to, um, to enforce that. And, um, uh, and that's a very big issue. I think pretty, Victoria will speak a bit more about that in a minute. Um, the, uh, and then various other things about how we can better provide channels, how we can um, allow for, um, make, it, make it easier to share data, to make it easier to index uh, to, um, um, and to incentivize. So those are the kinds of things. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was good to hear. We agree that the, uh, you, know, you do need to have a firm policy on, on data availability. And that's what we came up with. So this is, um, this is what we now have on all our papers is that in addition to the other metadata on things like funding and, and competing interests, we actually now say, where is your data? And when anyone submits to us, they have to tell us where they've put it. And is it in a repository? Is it attached to the paper? Is it in supplementary information? Um, you know, we don't care where, but it has to be somewhere. And this is a great example um, of someone who's done this very well, um, you know, with, uh, with clear accession numbers for, for all their data, databases. And then the very large data they've, they've um, deposited in uh, GigaScience, which is a journal um, from, I think, Biomed Central, um, who allow for, for storage of very, very large data sets. Uh, it's based out of the um, Beijing uh, Genomics Institute. So that's, um, so this is, this is, to us, is the sort of standard that we need to be pushing. Uh, I don't, I'm sure some of you saw when this was announced a couple of months ago, <coughs> there was an extraordinary response from the community, um, and I probably about a 50-50 split between people thinking it was a fantastic step forward and a, a completely impossible dream. Um, so we, so it's been an interesting few months. I think you know there are lots of logistics to actually, you know, getting people to really comply fully with this. But at the moment, you know, this a firm expression of of intent. I think is is, is what we've done, and I think it has been very successful in, in raising the issue. Uh, I just put this in at the last minute just because it was an interesting meeting we've had recently and I hope hopefully will will lead to something quite important which is that we're working with other journals. Um, Embo Journal is exemplary in its, uh, in its data um, accessibility and, uh, and so it's great to be working with them. F1000, Biomed Central and eLife um, are all journals who, who take this issue very seriously and so together we were thinking about coming up with some kind of standard, another standard, um, a badge that can perhaps go on papers that will um, that will show that, that, the, that this complies with the kind of highest standards of data availability. Register reports I won't talk about because I think uh, numerous other people have, but this, um, in fact, Galen mentioned it earlier. That's something that we're interested in. Um, the, the person who pushes Cortex were really the, it's an Elsevier journal that have, uh, were the first to do this properly. Um, and the editor who, who ran it is also one of our academic editors, Chris Chambers, and is very keen to implement it on Plus One. It's a, as Galen mentioned it's, it is a big undertaking, but I think it's something that we're very interested in and, and keen to roll out in some way. So, correcting the literature. The, um, the idea that there will always be papers that are irre irreproducible, um, that you, know, you can never get complete, 
you know, truth in the literature, and that's fine. Everyone accepts that you know, the scientific process involves correction and, and, uh, and that the literature does need to self-correct. But I don't think that's an excuse for not, for not doing it in a way that is immediately apparent to people coming to the literature and new. Um, actually, I'll come to that in a minute. But first of all, so negative results, again, has been talked a lot about. We have always pushed very hard for negative results. Um, it's a, it was one of the reasons PLOS One was set up. Um, PLOS One, I, I, I sort of assume everyone knows, but PLOS One's criteria is essentially we will evaluate the science um, objectively and we won't make any kind of in, um, assessment on the importance of the, of the finding and we won't reject a paper because it's not novel enough and it's not high enough impact. We just want to report the, um, any science that has been done, done properly and carefully. Um, and so negative results, mean, that means that we're a great forum for negative results. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, it was a very strange paper that was in the, I think, British Journal of Psychiatry, or Psychology, sorry, um, about essentially um, the idea of precognition, you know, the idea that people can be, have psychic abilities and things. And the paper itself is uh, by, by Daryl Ben. In, in the paper, he did say, this is clearly a fairly extraordinary finding. We encourage people to, to try to replicate it, and we'll be interested in seeing how that goes. These guys did this, Chris French and um, Richard Wiseman, and, and no one would publish it. The British Journal of Psychology said they wouldn't publish it. Um, it went through, I think, four different journals. Uh, and in fact, Chris French did a really fascinating blog about this. And he report, um, as he went along, he, uh, he told this terrible story of, uh, of the journal that even said, we want, to re we want reproductions, and then when they offered one, they didn't want it. Um, and eventually it came to plus one, and, and of course, uh, we published it, and, uh, and look, I mean, you know, I, I disagree with the statement that negative findings are uh, uh, low impact. You know, this has, had, this has had a huge impact and, you know, continues to be regularly cited. I think, um, uh, and this is just one example we have, mainly in psychology, we get, um, we get a lot of these failed replications, uh, which we publish, and they always lead to fantastic debate and, uh, and lots of interesting, um, yeah, it's a, a debate within the literature. <clears throat> um, the psychologists seem to be particularly good at this. Other areas are much worse. And in fact, even though we have always encouraged negative results, they make up a very tiny fraction of our overall um, output. Um, and it seems that it is just, it's just incentivizing people to do it. You know, they're, they're, it's quite a lot of effort to publish um, anything, as you'll know, and, uh, and so to write up a result that, that hasn't really done anything, and, you know, to, and to finish the experiment, you know, to actually go back and make sure that you've got your, a complete data set that is reliable, is a lot of work, and so we just find that people aren't, aren't really submitting it. So here we go, so this is the paper, this is the original paper uh, from, from Daryl Bem, and uh, um, Actually, sorry, it's not British Journal of Psychology. I apologise to the British Journal of Psychology. Uh, it's, uh, it was, yeah. Um, but anyway, they... Um, um, so, yeah, what's interesting about this is that you can't see anywhere that there's been any kind of refutation of this paper. And this seems to me a very big problem. I mean, you know, in this case, it's more complicated because it was different authors doing it, and, you know, it's sort of the... How much the, the original author of this um, agreed is, is, is unclear. Um, but the, in a lot of cases, you get the same authors um, doing a paper, you know, redoing work, um, publishing it, th that finds the opposite result. They'll publish it elsewhere in the literature, but then the original paper will have no mention of that. Um, that's a great case of a, of a, a paper in a high-impact journal that had um, um, several hundred citations. Uh, the authors then, it was about um, um, dentate gyrus um, recruitment of neurons, and the... Um, uh, the authors went back, redid the study much more carefully, and found actually that it was the, the findings was completely false. Uh, published that paper in a much lower impact journal, which has had a fraction of the number of citations. And since the publication of that second paper, the original paper's had another hundred citations. So you know, there's clearly a very big issue here with people coming to the literature and not finding these the links between papers. One way that you might be able to deal with this is retracting. I think someone mentioned that that you know that should the author be uh, should the author actually. Uh, you know, do the right thing and say we, we accept that this finding was, was false and therefore we're withdrawing the paper from the literature. So sort of hesitated to bring this up because this is a bit of sort of uh, a sore spot in, a, in our history. We, we did this once. We tried retracting a paper that had basically been a finding that had been, you know, proved I think quite conclusively to be, to be incorrect. Um, and so the authors um, decided to actually, you know, withdraw the paper. And there was an unbelievable outcry. Um, people felt that this was exactly the wrong thing to do. I mean, a retraction um, is essentially saying that we want to strike this from the literature. And of course, you know, there is some, relevant here. There is some relevance here. This is the first time that this, this virus had been cloned, for example. There was lots of, um, lots of sort of data that was valid, but the overall conclusions were false. And so the paper was, and that was their grounds for retraction. 
I think what we learned, and I think others, others agreed, was that, you know, that that probably isn't the right thing to do, you know, that that's a sort of step too far, and that you do, that this, these research does need to exist in the literature, but it just needs to have something on it that tells you that, there's, that there are problems with it. And there's no way of doing that at the moment. Corrections, you know, don't really go far enough. Uh, retractions, as I said, are, are very problematic. This is a possibility, this little badge here, it's called Crossmark. And what that does is sits on all our papers, and not only on the... Um, on the um, HTML, but also on the PDF. So if you've downloaded this to your hard drive, this is a little live link that will sit on your PDF. And when you click it, it tells you whether this is the most recent version. And so really at the moment it's useful for, um, for if they, so for example, if this paper w was later retracted, you know, if it was just sitting on your hard drive, you wouldn't know that because, um, because you'd already downloaded it. But with this, it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a little link into the, the kind of most recent um, literature. So that's quite interesting. Uh, it can al it'll also tell you about corrections, but at the moment that's as far as it goes. We're talking to them at the moment about whether you could take that further and actually sort of have it as a way of, of saying there's new research that suggests that this is perhaps unsound. Um, it's, it's slightly aspirational at the moment, but I see that sees, that to me that seems like one way that we could perhaps fit, um, deal with this, this issue. Post-publication peer review is something, again, Elizabeth mentioned briefly yesterday. Um, it's something that we um, see as very important in, 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 again, this same idea that, you know, once the paper's out there, there's more commenting, there are changes that can be made after the fact, and we need ways of, of properly marking that. So open evaluation is a tool that we're working on at the moment. It's still in, in, in kind of pilot phase. But um, the idea is that we, you have a kind of streamlined way of reviewing papers after they've been published and that, you'll, that they will um, be somehow listed on the paper. And, and over time, you'll kind of get this kind of crowdsourced idea of, of the reliability and the impact of the, of the work. Public Commons have also tried. This is something that was launched a few months ago. Um, on PubMed itself, where basically they're asking for people to comment on papers within this, this environment. Um, they have, as we all have, had a lot of trouble with uptake. Um, and again, I think the sort of incentives for commenting are still not right at the moment and that there is, there is a big gap there. So, um, but certainly this is a good step forward. It's a, you know, it's a central place and they've got, they've got you know, lots, of, lots of kind of buy-in from people who, who like the idea of it, but actually just trying to persuade them to, to make comments has been problematic. And then, of course, you know, once you've made the comments, if someone comments on your paper, and we do see this once in a while on Plus One, where they say, um, someone will say, this looks fine, but I think your analysis is a bit shonky, or you, know, you're, you're, you need to try this statistical test or something. And the authors will then go back and do that, and then, and then send us the reanalysis. And at the moment, we just have to write a correction, essentially, which is really not the right thing here. I and mean, what we're doing is we're updating and we're evolving the, the article, um, but the current system of publication doesn't really allow us to do that. So. Um, so one people who, uh, um, and so, you know, the idea that we're uh, interested in is that you can have versions and that actually you would have an updated version that would sit alongside. And again, mark, indexed through Crossmark, marked in PubMed and that kind of thing, so that you can actually have um, a way of updating the literature. F1000 research, I just wanted to briefly mention, because they're doing this quite, doing quite an interesting thing where they, they are looking at this post-publication peer review. They're essentially post papers online, ask reviewers to, um, to review it after it's been published. You then get uh, ticks. If you get a certain number of, of positive reviews, then it gets index in, indexed in, in PubMed. It's, it's an interesting idea. It's, it's certainly, you know, they also ask for full data availability. You know, it's very kind of forward thinking and very interesting. It also hasn't been hugely well taken up at the moment. And I think it's, um, that is an sort of interesting lesson that it's important that you bring the community with you when, uh, when you try these things. And it's sort of interesting, you know, it, it is difficult to persuade scientists to change their ways. So I think that's a, a lesson learned. And I think that's all I had to say. <laughs> right on time. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, one more speaker to stimulate your appetite just before lunch. Dr. Victoria Stodden is a professor, uh, assistant professor of, of statistics from Columbia University. Please come forward. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you to, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you to Pamela and uh, Brian, Lita, and folks for. Um, inviting me to participate and present to you all. This has been um, a fascinating meeting. So what I'd like to do in my presentation is just spend a few minutes to hopefully surface additional concerns as if reproducibility was not complicated enough, but try and bring in some other ideas that I haven't actually heard yet being uh, discussed. So um, 
When I think about issues in reproducibility, uh, I think the right place to start, and this to some degree echoes some of the opening comments in Dr. Reeves' talk this morning, uh, I think thinking about well, what we really mean by the scientific method is one fruitful way to start framing these issues. And if we all kind of know that there's traditionally two branches to the scientific method, our very early deductive branch, mathematics, logic, and then uh, that quickly fell short when we had observational data and we wanted to do inference, so we developed the empirical branch or inductive branch, um, essentially comprising our statistical analysis of controlled experiments. And I, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard all of this um, sort of, I don't want to call it hype, but there's a lot of discussion about how with computational technologies, very powerful computers, and sort of data deluge, we have new branches of the scientific method, right? Like the third branch of the scientific method, fourth branch, and so on. Um, uh, I want to just leave that in your mind and then put this in contraposition. So some of this I think there was uh, discussed a little bit yesterday and uh, I'm sure you've seen some of these discussions already. Uh, it, this is all of these articles that have come out, Nature Science, the Special Issue and The Economist, they're less than a year old and in fact um, the uh, issue in science there about new standards for reproducibility, it's just from January as I'm sure many in this room are aware. And, um, and you can even see this bleeding into LA Times and the popular press all about, you know, do we really know what we're doing and what costs are federally funded and uh, research and uh, this starts to really make it imperative not just for scientific integrity but for public trust issues uh, tackling these notions of reproducibility. So how do we put that against the way that we traditionally carry out science using the scientific method? Um, I think the, the, the rationale behind the scientific method is really the ubiquity of error. And so we have this um, concretized way of recognizing that error can creep in anywhere in the scientific process from things like very early on in experimental design to things like handling of materials, reporting typos, like every single part, I mean, we, we are people carrying this out in, um, uh, in the real world. So we have this motivation in the scientific method to really root out error. So in the, in the deductive branch, you don't publish mathematical finding without the proof and there's standards around what we understand this proof to be and this is verified in some sense before publication. Uh, in the empirical branch, we have an entire machinery of hypothesis testing. Again, Dr. Rees mentioned this um, early on this morning. Uh, appropriate statistical methods, structured communications, our methods section, some of the discussion even in this session about well, how, how are these structured communication um, uh, uh, methods and uh, sort of, I guess, protocols you would say, are they appropriate to the types of re research that we're doing now? That Do they actually engender reproducibility? So I wanted to surface a third issue which is around computation. So in a sense, um, I think all this discussion around third and fourth branches of the scientific method uh, really is only potential until we join reporting standards that exist in other branches around computation. And this is something where we saw, for example, um, editing genome this morning and things where there is an intersection between computational methods and the type of research that's being discussed in, in this workshop. So uh, data sets stored digitally, uh, made openly available, how is that linked up to the publication and not just to the publication itself, but how is it methodologically linked up? Do we have actually the software steps of analysis, if there were any, available that generated those figures or generated those findings? So the claim that, that I'm making is this, when we have these standards around the computational aspects, we can really start to elevate third and fourth branch uh, to bona fide branches of the scientific method, similar to what we have for, for first and second branch. Um, one of the other ideas I want to throw out to you that I think is behind my first couple of slides is that this notion of reproducibility, we use the word um, in a very facile way and uh, it's actually, I think, somewhat of an overloaded term. Um, ideas like empirical reproducibility, so I think this is most of what we've been talking about today. Can I actually take your description in your paper, go into my lab, um, to, can I access the same materials, can I go through and follow your protocols and end up with substantially similar results confirming or, or perhaps providing counter evidence for uh, the findings in the paper. Um, I think another notion of 
reproducibility that's exceptionally important that I was just trying to bring into the, into the discussion is this idea of computational reproducibility. So if I start from, say, a digital data set, maybe it's um, genome data, maybe it's a, another form of data, can I actually follow your computational steps and arrive at the same conclusions that you had or the same figures, the same tables, the same output? Um, that's a little bit different than what I'm calling empirical reproducibility and requires a different set of thinking around how we communicate and how we disseminate that information. Uh, the final form of reproducibility that, that I think it's useful to pull out into a category is statistical reproducibility. So that differs from the first two in the sense that um, do I have sufficient power? So we've talked about that a little bit today in my test. Have I, have I done the experimental design in such a way that allows me to draw the conclusions that I want to draw? Have I even done the right tests? All, this, all the discussion about one tail test, two tail, and so on. Are the statistics actually sound um, and have they been based on appropriate methods? So I think I found it useful to pull these out as separate issues in dealing with the issue of um, reproducibility and um, how we actually um, raise that standard um, and how we communicate the results uh, and, and other types of findings. I thought since we're sitting here at uh, National Academy of Sciences, I should mention this report. Um, the reason I'm mentioning it, it was primarily because it's from 2003, uh, which I think is a very salient fact, more than 10 years old. The report is called Sharing Publication-Related Data and Materials. Um, the first principle in this report says authors should include in their publications the data, algorithms, other information that's central or integral to the publication. That is, whatever is necessary to support the major claims of the paper and would enable one skilled in the art to verify or replicate the claims. So we've got a lot of discussion around this. This isn't a new issue that's being foist upon us. And I think embedded in here, when they talk about algorithms and they talk about data, are notions not just of empirical reproducibility, but also computational reproducibility and statistical reproducibility with their different attendant standards. I also wanted to mention um, briefly what I think is actually engendering something of a sea change around these different ways of thinking about reproducibility. So the Institute of Medicine, I, I'm, I'm guessing most people are aware of this report, but I'll just very quickly recap where it came from. So this report, Evolution of Translational Omics, Lessons Learned and the Path Forward. So this was released in March of 2012, and this came to some degree out of irreproducible results in genomics. It's a very long, complicated story, but essentially open data allowed researchers to start to try to verify published results and found they couldn't, and in fact they were able to guess at mistakes that had possibly been made in the, in the papers and then uh, match the results when those mistakes were bedded into the workflow, surfacing all these problems about how do we actually verify claims, what should be made available, and so on. The reason that I put this report in here is it makes some recommendations to the FDA around around uh, data required to approve clinical trials. So I, I put that this is sort of the, in my opinion, the, the money slide or the money figure in that, in that report. You don't really need to see exactly what's going on here, but I wanted you to notice that there's this bright yellow line down the middle. And what this yellow line means, and I pulled out some text from uh, the description, the fully specified computational procedures behind the actual, um, uh, that's being proposed to be tested in the clinical trials. The fully specified computational procedures are locked down in the discovery phase and should remain unchanged in all subsequent development steps. So this probably seems intuitive to everyone here. To my knowledge, this is the first time the FDA is dealing with software and availability of software and incorporating this into standards for approval of clinical trials. Before, making data available was enough, but now this link is starting to be closed around reproducibility. You can have data, you can have results, and it, they can be um, reproducible and valid, but without that code and the sort of software step, it's very difficult and sometimes impossible to sort of make that link and, and close the loop. Okay, so um, in this slide, what I wanted to do was mention some of the tools, and I think there was a comment made this morning about how many of these issues around reproducibility are cultural. Uh, many of these standards exist, and I think that's absolutely true. However, there was also another point that says the easier we can make it on folks, on researchers, to do things like track what they're doing in their experiment, make this more easily available, make data more easily available, software more easily available, if we can help make that 
sort of more costless, easier to review, then this sort of helps advance us towards reproducibility. So um, this slide says there's some tools that are starting to chip away at this problem and make things easier. And uh, one thing that I'll have you notice about just about all the, the tools up here is most of them come from academics, researchers themselves who've identified the problem. In their spare time, they're starting to put together bits and pieces of track workflow that allow people to disseminate things easier. This isn't, you know, an industry source kind of swooping in and building, like Microsoft building some big tool for it. There's a little Microsoft in there. But this is really something emergent from the community because these problems are something that people are very worried about. So all of these are hot linked and I'll put my slides on my website and presumably they're made available through the workshop as well. So if you're interested, I don't have time to go through all of these, but some of them are really, um, uh, really phenomenal. If you look at iPaul, this is from the image processing community. They've developed a journal. They're worried about reproducibility, so they start this new journal. Uh, all online, you have a page for um, the paper and the results. You have a page for playing with the algorithm and rerunning things in the cloud interactively through that through that uh, website, and also uploading your own images and trying out the algorithms on those images, and another page that says all the, all the images that have been uploaded, and you can see all the results and all the interaction and so on. So these things, in a sense, when you see them, they're very intuitive on how we could have more embedded verification in our publication process, um, but until you kind of see it, you don't always sort of think about it. So I sort of grouped these tools into three overlapping categories, some in dissemination platforms, how do, this is primarily focused on code and data, but how do you sort of get data code out there associated with publications? I've been working on researchcompendia.org, I'll talk about that in just one moment very briefly. Um, what do you do to make it easier to disseminate? So all these tools around workflow, um, tracking, uh, research environments, how do you get to that point of publication and then make it much easier to give another researcher um, information that they would need to replicate or understand your experiments. So you get to the, I mean you've all probably had this experience where you get to the point of publication and a reviewer says, yeah, what about that thing in figure two, can you try it this way? And you're like, oh geez, now I have to go back and recalculate everything. Then so maybe that's something that shouldn't be like that and we should just have more efficient ways of capturing that information as you go along. So small changes actually are not challenging and annoying. Um, the final category, embedded publishing, there are some efforts around um, giving you, instead of a static PDF, something that has code, data interactivity embedded in it so that this is more alive and you have verifiability sort of baked in. Okay, Research Compendia. So the idea of Research Compendia that I've been working on, uh, this we launched it in November and uh, essentially it's a website that throws up a web page for a publication and that web page is linked to the publication say in Science Direct or PubMed or whatnot or SSRN, um, Archive, whatever it is. Um, it, 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 it makes code and data available to, persistently available to readers. So if you have um, a publication, you can find out where to get um, code and data. We call it a compendium page. And we're fooling around with things like, can we get it running in the compendium page? Can you change parameters and see what happens? Um, we have things in, in, on the compendium page around commenting and so on. So there can be versioning or improvements in the code, bug fixes, and without breaking that link to reproducibility. Okay, so there's what um, a compendium page would look like. You could link out to the paper um, link by clicking on the title. You have programmers or code authors or data curators and so on listed here, not just authors, and then descriptions of the code. And you can see grabbing code data. This is a PLOS One article, so we also link, you can directly download the article too since it's open access. Okay. So sorry to be moving so quickly. I want to leave lots of time for questions. Oh, and it's all open source, so it's on GitHub there if you wanted to grab it and make your own version or journals wanted to use it. It's all openly available. Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention is some of the activity that's been going on around um, 
sort of engagement, standards development around code, around data, around linking to publications. This was a workshop at Brown University. I was a co-organizer of, you can see there was six of us organizing on the right, called Reproducibility in Computational and Experimental Mathematics. So different to the topic we're talking about here today, yet many similar and overlapping issues. Um, there are lots of discussions actually around reproducibility in different areas across the scientific research landscape. Very, uh, it's very rare for them to actually intersect. It's mostly siloed discussions and there's no awareness really of what's happening in, in other fields. So I throw this out here. There was, um, oh, yeah, we collaboratively came up with a workshop report. Uh, we, it was a week-long workshop, uh, which has a couple of publications describing it with standards around things like what should your code look like, what should your data look like, um, what type of persistence are we talking about, and what type of reporting standards should be in the paper when you're using computational methods. Uh, so this was starting to sort of chip away at that problem, which has intersected some of the discussion that we've been having here um, around, well, when you have a computational component, when you have digital data, uh, what's appropriate for reproducibility in, in that aspect? Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it here and open, I presumably open the floor to, to discussions, and, and, and what I, I hope I've surfaced kind of more complicated issues that, that we can talk about. All right, I want to thank the speakers for giving some great and thought-provoking presentations and now the moment you've been waiting for, questions from our participants. So the mics are loading up already. Let's. Hi, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Paul Locke from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. That is the third time I've mentioned it, so I don't have to say it again. Um, th those are really interesting presentations and I, I wanted to um, make one comment and ask a question. First, my comment is that uh, I um, end up doing research in another field, and in that field, um, you can tell immediately whether um, something has been overruled or reversed by going to the literature. And um, when I look in the scientific literature, I think you pointed out that you can't really tell if an, if, um, an article that's been written has been retracted or amended or somehow. So, I'm wondering, uh, my first comment is I'm wondering whether um, looking at how other fields do this, excuse me, in terms of publication might benefit uh, science and the scientific literature. Um, second, um, just question for you is, um, uh, Dr. Stodden, you had a very nice quote from a, a, na uh, a National Academy report about the quality of data. I couldn't write it all down, but um, it seems to me that that really is a key question, and as someone who has been involved in doing some data mining and trying to kind of reverse engineer how um, people got conclusions in their articles, I've always been a little bit disappointed. So I just wondered whether perhaps you could comment on, on your experiences in this um, area, have you seen that people have really risen to the challenge of providing the sort of data that's needed to do reproducibility studies? That's a great question. So um, uh, I have actually a publication in PLOS One that I didn't get a chance to talk about, which essentially it tries to look at what are journal policies around reproducibility, around code requirements and data requirements. So one, so one stakeholder in this is what our journal's doing. And um, I looked at in June of 2000, uh, 2011 and 2012, and I just saw this rapid um, uh, journals sort of taking on this issue in a very rapid way. And so my sense is, I actually, I, I think probably if you were doing the forensics that you're talking about now and five years ago and ten years ago, it might be somewhat similar. However, I do see, for example, workshops like this, movement on journal policies, funding agencies talking about this. And so um, I'm very encouraged that this is really something where we're going to not just talk about the importance of the issue of reproducibility. Everyone kind of, I think, gets that but talk about, well, how do we implement this and what are our steps, particularly like what is data that's useful to reuse? What are standards on code? I can put a whole bunch of messy code out there, but no one can make any sense of it. How is that helpful? And issues that these are just starting to land on people's plates now. And where do reviewers kind of fit into this? And um, I have some ideas around um, sort of submission of um, <coughs> 
code that runs, for example, and you can make use of it. And I think we're going to start discussing these new ways of disseminating um, the, at least the computational aspects of the research to really kind of embed reproducibility in there, lighten the burden on reviewers, and allow people to, to really reuse the data and code in a way that's effective. Um, just briefly to speak to your first question. Um, the, uh, yes, you're right. There are um, areas that, that do this better than others. Um, I'm slight, I, I hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, if, if it's a small field, then you, you know, and everyone just knows. And, that, you know, there's this sort of these mythical 50 papers that, in the literature that everyone knows are wrong. But in fact, you know, that's, that's not, uh, it's not really good enough, is it? <laughs> I mean, it sort of feels, you know, you, it, it does need to be explicit, you know, to a PhD student coming in, looking at the literature perhaps for the first time, and that they can immediately know the current, current state of knowledge. And I think that needs to be reflected in the literature. Uh, Monty Westerfield, University of Oregon. Um, I uh, would like a little more discussion about central data repositories, which I think are extremely important. Um, uh, running one myself, of course, I think they're very important. Uh, but I'd like discussion about two, uh, two problems, um, and that is uh, evolving methodologies and longevity. Uh, so. The uh, research landscape is a moving target for data repositories because methodologies change all the time. A good example would be image processing. We used to use film. Um, now we use um, uh, many, many different kinds of formats uh, for digital recording. There are no standards. Uh, so for a centralized data repository, this is really difficult. You have to be facile. Uh, you have to, have to support uh, totally outdated uh, technologies. Um, so how do we deal with that? And then the second question is longevity, which is, do I really want to put my data into a repository that may not be there in five or ten years? So should there really be buy-in by uh, NIH or, or uh, governments or worldwide to make a commitment uh, that these data will actually be stable and available in the future? So if I can just sort of take a crack at your two points. Um, I think those are two key issues on why a repository is important in the scholarly record or data code repository. Um, one is to provide that link that to make the, to that particular snapshot, which is the publication in the scholarly record, and associate whatever the data was then. Maybe it's had errors corrected, but whatever it happened to be when that, um, that result was published, and also software that allowed that, those results to be extracted. Both of those can and should evolve, but however, that versioning that, that sort of associates that is something that's very important that, that we that we embed into that process. So I think that's something where um, we have a whole lot of formats on data. We have um, you know you can you can apply the exact same thing to software. So I used an old version of um, R with certain old libraries. How does that persist? And I think there are technological solutions to that. To having um, and I'm happy to talk more about it maybe offline. So I don't, it's not too long. But um, having these sort of very lightweight virtual machines around a publication that allows all of this to sort of travel with the publication in a way that that supports that format or supports whatever you know particular instantiation of the code worked at that particular time. And that, that naturally leads into your second point, which is longevity. So how do we, if I want to look at a research paper that's five years old, how do I understand reproducibility and make sure that that actually is something that works, um, at least in the computational sense? And, um, and that's something where I think being able to capture that environment that ran code and supported the formats of data at the time of publication and having that sort of tight link um, and, and assigning DOIs, say, to code and data that support that persistence, I think, is incredibly important. So something like um, NIH has some buy-in. They support a number of repositories themselves, of course, and then their Office of Data Science Oh, I think it's Office of Data Science um, with, that Phil Bourne is running. Um, this is, I think these are, these are efforts to sort of have more congruence across the community. Um, however, NIH is, seems to be in the forefront, and other agencies are sort of either looking to see what NIH is doing, like, for example, NSF, um, and, uh, and how they actually buy into what's happening in the community, I think, is something that's incredibly important. However, um, 
it's, it's not going to be the final say. We have to, I think, in, in some sense, you know, it's this wide open question and we have to be ready to use what's out there like Dryad, for example, or Dataverse Network, for example, and um, your repository, for example. Um, and, and there's a print, the final thing I'll say is there's a principle called locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. So um, putting this, having uh, sort of quasi backups or having your um, data repeated in different repositories helps with that persistence as well. So I think that's something where you're absolutely right. You don't want to be locked into one particular instantiation of a repository. Uh, I agree. You've, you also, in, in a way, answered part of your own question. There's who's going to actually bear the burden of the cost of maintaining these repositories? And that's certainly a question we ask at the APS because there are lots of data. Um, it, it, is, it comes at a cost. It's, it's not free to everybody to just dump your data there. The other issue that <coughs> comes to mind as I'm sitting here and came up from a question yesterday is we do, you know, you think about putting all the data out there for everybody to use, but there's lots of proprietary data um, that we deal with all the time, um, you know, and that has to be considered as well. And how do you deal with that in light of all the other things going on in the literature? So I have a couple of comments on dealing with proprietary data. Um, <laughs> well, it, it's a big one. It's not just proprietary data, but also where you have patients and confidentiality issues, privacy issues, and we're, we can sort of talk about open data, making things available, making things reproducible, but there are very real barriers, not just ethical barriers that we would feel, but legal barriers like HIPAA and so on. Um, but I think what, what we're starting to do is think about it not as a black and white, open and closed, but are there actually gray areas and places we can innovate? Like, for example, suppose with proprietary data or, or confidential data, you can authorize certain users into the group. Okay, so this is much smaller than, say, having something open, but you could still have some sense of independent replication or checking and so on. And so I think sort of innovating around walled gardens or however you'd like to call it, um, uh, and trying to sort of expand that gray area rather than having sort of like it's open or it's closed. I think this, these are ways to kind of step towards uh, reproducibility as well. Thank you. Here, sir, please. Thanks. Uh, first, I'm, I'm not Paul Locke from Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm required to say that. <laughs> he, he is, yes. Okay. Um, um, I'm Bob Disco from the University of Michigan. I want to sort of change the tone, take this back to the lab animal part. Um, and basically, I, I've been in, really impressed with all the, the talks that we've heard, but I'm unfortunately coming to the conclusion that it's a miracle that anything's ever been reproduced in science because of the number of variables. And as a person who directs a laboratory animal you know, housing and care program, I'm becoming now tremendously worried because I've got to worry about um, bedding, food, what that does to the microbiome, um, the gender of the person taking care of the cage, is it um, in a ventilated cage or a non-ventilated cage, did it get changed between them, how long is the trip between the animal facility and the imaging center, all these kinds of things. And, and that's not even including the one-off um, you know, emergencies or crises or whatever that may have occurred in the middle where they got fenbendazole chow for a while because they were in a room that was positive for pinworms. I'm, I'm really concerned that if we really try to ensure that things are reproducible, the laundry list of what I am going to have to make sure every investigator knows and then every investigator puts into the journal article is going to be unbelievably extensive and in fact then make the study almost irreproducible because you couldn't repeat what happened at my facility. I mean, does anybody else have any comments or stuff like on that? Well, we have a panelist that would like to comment first and then, yeah, I encourage uh, responses from participants in the audience. Um, I don't really have, I mean, you know, it's, you're raising the whole issue of animal models at all, I think, and you know, obviously that's a very big one. I think, you know, what we can do as journals is, is you know, try try to. What can we do? Uh, <laughs> I forgot my point actually, but yeah, the I mean, you know, you're right. We can do. Um, I I think there are sort of basic standards that can help. I think the the scale of the issue is only just becoming apparent, and perhaps it will. Perhaps it will come to a point where um, where it, it, you know the whole system and the models that we use need need complete reevaluation. So um, yeah, I mean, there, there isn't an awful lot we can do about that. I think you know checklists are a good start, but it's not going to deal with that fundamental issue. Anyway. 
I, I share many of your concerns um, because I, I deal with them on a daily basis. The, you know, I guess I, I reconcile that with the fact that we have been able to find and reproduce many studies over decades. So I, I don't view science as in total free fall and crisis. I actually, this reproducibility issue in, in my mind is actually an opportunity, not, not a crisis. I, I find it interesting that there are some differences that different labs have, or even the same lab has. You know, the, the comment about the superstar person who can, is the one who does that procedure. Well, is he the superstar or is he the guy who really can't jump at all? Um, you know, and, and is doing something totally wrong that now has changed the phenomenon. So I think there are lots of things that can, can impact that. When it comes to husbandry, you know, individual things, you know, if you look at the size of the effect, and I, I think we, we get lost in that. We have wonderful ways of, of statistically analyzing data, and people come out and they say, oh, it's a point zero 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 one phenomenon. That must mean it's a great big effect. No, it doesn't. And I think we all know that. And so we, we really need to take step back a little bit and, and look at that. We want to have consistent husbandry practices, as, as consistent as we can get. But there's people involved in that. You know, one day it might be a guy changing the cage, the next day it might be a woman. But, you know, the, the group's going through the same protocol. And so as long as we're consistent doing that, we, you know, we have to, to understand that. And, and I think that's something we, we need to reconcile. But we need to recognize it as well. And, and just pretending that it doesn't exist, I don't think is the, is the point. I think, you know, if we get differences under those conditions, great. If, there, if we find that it's not reproducible, maybe we need to go back and look at the gut microbiome, the food, what time of year it is. Maybe that was where the difference came out. But, it, but that's an opportunity. That allows us to, to grow our, you know, our knowledge base. So I, I don't find it to be that big of a problem myself. So just uh, putting my statistician's hat on, I think there are, um, there's a statistical framing on this, which is you can think of it like omitted variable problems. And um, uh, there are questions raised, say, in social science uh, research where uh, you, you're dealing with real people and measurements, and you can't really capture everything that may have gone into finding such and such a result. So it's actually very analogous to what you're saying. And um, they're wrestling with these issues as well. And so I would actually reiterate um, uh, Dr. Edwards' uh, point, which is maybe some of these things actually turn out not to be statistically significant, and um, or maybe there are sort of big omitted variables that are that, that need to be drilled into a little more. So it seems like it's to some to some degree some of it's still open. We actually probably know. I, I'm not a life scientist, but I would imagine that there's there's a lot that's known actually about how these factors interact and so on. And so um, I don't think all hope is lost, but I think this this sort of standards and framing that he's talking about can can help, and I think thinking about this is trying to capture these omitted variables that are significant is maybe one useful framing. Okay, we're starting to eat into the lunch hour a little bit. Excuse the pun. Um, I hate to break off the discussion, but no, no, no. I, oh. You've been waiting a long time, so <laughs> if you can just ask a brief question and we'll get an answer and then we'll break for lunch. It wouldn't be brief. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so then maybe take it up with the panelists during the lunch hour. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank the speakers again. Thank you, um, participants, for a great discussion. Thank you. That was honest. Yeah, exactly.